We are covering the solutions to practice final number one. First few problems refers to this graph shown. Car is initially at rest on a straight road. The graph shows the acceleration of the car along that road as a function of time. So in each of these one second blocks, the acceleration is constant value. So we can use the formulas for the for the velocity and the displacement with constant acceleration for each of these blocks. And what I'll do, since they actually it's a little tedious, you have to figure out what's going on over a rather large interval, I'm going to just make a table. From 0 to 1, the acceleration is 0. From 1 to 2, it's 3. 2 to 3, it's 3. OK, so 0 to 1, it's 0. 1 to 2, it's 3. Then it's 3. Then it's 2. Then it's 0. Then it's minus 1, and so on. Now, to get the acceleration at time equal to zero, sorry, to get the velocity at time equal to zero, it starts off at zero, but then we use the fact that v is equal to v zero plus a delta t, and delta t is one second for each of these one second blocks. So it's just the previous v plus a, so zero plus zero is zero, zero plus three is three, three plus three is six, six plus two is eight, and this is how we get the velocities at the various times. In order to get the uh, positions at these various times, we start off at, let's say, x is equal to 0. And then uh, to get the new x value, you can use either 1 half a delta t squared plus v0 delta t. That will work just fine. Or we can just use its x0, the position at the beginning of the interval, plus the average of the beginning and the, beginning and the end velocities times delta t. So for example, here in this interval from uh, 0 to 1, I start at 0. Obviously, the velocity, the average velocity is 0, so x will also remain 0. But in the interval from 1 to 2, the average velocity is, is 3 over 2, or 1 and 1 half. So we take 1 and 1 half, the average of these velocities, times delta t, which is 1 and 1 half plus 0. And to get the next value of x, the average v is halfway between 3 and 6, that's 4.5, times delta t is 4.5, uh, plus this here, 1 and 1 half plus 4 and 1 half is 6. The average of 6 and 8 is 7, add 7 to 6, you get 13. Average of 8 and 8 is 8, add that to 13, you get 21. If you keep going like this, you can fill out the table. Okay, so now they want to know where the speed is for t equals to 7. Just read it off from the table. Okay, so we get that speed is 5, the magnitude of the velocity. How much distance does the, the car cover in the first 9 seconds? It goes from 0 to 49, so it would be 49 meters. And how much distance is covered from 1 to 13? We go from 67 to 83. 83 minus 67 is 16 meters. Let's go on. The next problem, an archer show, shoots an arrow from a height of 1.21 meters above ground with initial velocity 51.5 meters per second at an initial angle 33.5 above horizontal. They want to know at what time after the release of the arrow will the bow uh, be flying exactly horizontal. So they want horizontal velocity. That means vy, the y component, equals to zero. So we're going to look at the y motion. But let's first get the y comp the initial y component. Okay, it's 51.5 is the magnitude of the velocity or the speed. So then this side of the triangle, the, the vertical component will be 51.5 times the sine of 33.5. That comes up to 20.4. Okay, so <clears throat> we start off with 20.4. We want the final vy to be 0. So we say vy is equal to v0y plus ay delta t, where ay is negative 9.8. So we get 284, 28.4 plus negative 9.8 times delta t. We can set that equal to 0. vy equals 0. And then we get delta t is 28.4 over 9.8, or 2.90 seconds. Let's go on. We have that a 
horse is drawing that sled horizontally across the snow-covered field. Coefficient of friction is 0.195. Mass of the sled, including the load, is 2002, which is 202.3 kilometers. Sorry, 202 kilograms. If the horse moves the sled at a constant speed of 1.805 meters per second, what is the power needed to accomplish this? Okay, so let's first look in the y direction. So the normal force balances out the force of gravity. We know the, the, the mass of the sled to 0, 2.3 kilograms times 9.8 gives 1,983 newtons for the weight, which is also equal to the normal force. Now we can calculate the force of friction. We're talking about kinetic friction here. We just do U K times the normal force. Uh, so we get 0 0.195 times 1,983 newtons. And we get 387 newtons. Okay, now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the motion in the x direction. We have the force, so we're told that it's moving with constant speed, so the acceleration is zero. So F goes this way, force of friction goes the other way, they must balance each other out. F minus FK is equal to zero, so F is equal to FK, which is 387. Now we just count the power exerted, so the power for a constant force will be force times the velocity of F in the direction of the force. In general, will be the force dotted with the velocity vector. But in this case, they're both pointing in the same direction. So it's 387 times 1.805, that's the speed given. And we get 698 watts. OK, the next problem is actually a difficult problem. We're talking about this uh, satellite comes in with a velocity VI1, and the planet has a velocity VI2, and the VI1 slingshots around okay, and goes in the reverse direction. It's all along a line. The, the trick here is this, is this is supposed to be treated as a one-dimensional elastic collision problem. Okay? For an elastic collision problem, we have conservation of momentum, and we have that the total initial kinetic energy equals the total final kinetic energy. But this is kind of difficult to deal with. Number two, doing the, this quadratic equation with two variables. So we're going to swap this condition of kinetic energy conservation for the fact that the relative velocity uh, keeps the same magnitude but flips its sign. In other words, the difference in the velocity vectors between 1 and 2 for the initial case is equal to the negative of the difference in the velocities between 1 and 2 for the final case. But there's an additional trick here. So I said this is kind of a difficult problem. The planet has a much larger mass, so we can speed things up by just noting that the initial velocity is approximately equal to the final velocity of the planet. The planet really doesn't get affected very much by the satellite. It just keeps moving. So I said that the relative velocity flips its sign, so v i2 minus v i1 is equal to negative v f2 minus v f1, but I'm going to replace v f2 by v i2. Okay, that's what I said here. The planet is not much affected by the satellite. And so now I have just vi2 minus vi1 is equal to negative i2. And then distribute the signs here plus vf1. So what we want to know is vf1. So vf1 is equal to minus uh, i1. And then plus, then I have two of these things. This would get a plus sign added to this guy. It would be 2 vi2. Plugging the numbers, you end up getting negative 35.9 kilometers per second. So the speed is 35.9 kilometers per second. Next problem. We have a roller coaster moving at 3.97 meters per second at the top of the hill. Um, ignore friction or air resistance. How fast is the roller coaster at the top of another hill, which is 15.1 meters high? So we use conservation of energy, Ki plus Ui is equal to Kf plus Uf. Ki is 1 half m, 3.97 squared. So m will not matter. It will be in all of the terms and drop out. The initial uh, potential energy will be m times g times the height, so m times 9.8 times 27.3. And 
and the final kinetic energy would be one half m v squared. We're going to solve for v, and the final potential energy would be m times u times y, the other y, and that would be nine point eight zero times fifteen point one. Okay, then we can cross out the m's, divide by m everywhere. We get one half v squared will end up being one hundred twenty seven point four, and then we get that the velocity is fifteen point nine six meters per second. Okay, next problem. What coefficient of friction is required to stop a hockey puck sliding at 11.3 meters per second initially over a distance of 16.5 meters? Okay, so we know the initial velocity, 11.3, uh, and the final velocity will be zero because it stops. We're told that delta x, the distance covered, will be 60.5 meters. So if vx squared minus v0x squared is equal to 2ax delta x. And so we have the x squared is 0, and then we have minus 11.3 for the initial velocity squared is equal to 2ax times 60.5, which would be delta x. You can solve for ax, it's minus 1.055 meters per second squared. Now that we know the acceleration, we can get the net force. F net x is equal to the force uh, due to kinetic friction, okay, fx, f k x, and that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay, just using the fact that it's net force. So we have m is equal to minus 1.055, that's the acceleration given. So using the fact that the, the net force is max, we can get the, the net force in terms of m. m will not matter, by the way. But now we actually want the coefficient of friction. So the coefficient of friction, uh, we can use the, the force of friction, kinetic friction fk, is the coefficient of kinetic friction uk times fn, but Fn will just be the normal force, but that will balance out the, the forces in the vertical direction, so it will be equal to the force of gravity, mg. So we get that Fk is mu k mg, but it's also, as seen above, m times minus 1.055. So we get that uh, mu k mg is equal to uh, 1.055 m. The, the minus sign doesn't matter, we're just getting uh, how, how big the, the force is. All right, so, so now we have uk is equal to, we can cross out the m's here, is equal to mu, uk is equal to 1.055 divided by g, which is 9.80, and we get 0 0.108. Next problem, a small, moving small toy bus rear ends in a larger toy school bus that's initially at rest, larger bus is several times more massive than the smaller bus, indicate which is true and false if the uh, collision is totally inelastic. So totally inelastic means they stick together, move together. The small bus exerts a large amount of force on the big bus than the big bus exerts on the small bus. Now, that's incorrect. Newton's third law says the forces are equal and magnitude but opposite in direction. Momentum is conserved in the equation. It's an isolated collision, so yes, momentum is conserved. Mechanical energy is conserved. No, uh, it's not conserved since the collision converts some energy into things like heat or the, the, the crumpling of, of the bumpers of the car. Uh, the two buses continue together at, at the same speed. At the, sorry, there's all these typos here. At the same speed, true. They move together in a totally inelastic. Collision. Okay, so the small bus comes to a complete stop. They continue to. Uh, if this is wrong. They, they continue to move. Okay, let's go on. To determine the muzzle velocity of a bullet fired from a rifle, you shoot a 3.17 gram bullet into a 2.45 kilogram wood block. The block is suspended by wires in the ceiling and initially at rest. After the bullet is embedded in the block, the block swings up to a maximum height of 0.563 centimeters from its initial position. What is the velocity of the bullet on leaving the gun barrel? Okay, this is a two-layer problem. You first use, we work backwards, first use conservation of energy to find the speed of the bullet plus the block right after the collision. So Ki plus Ui is equal to Kf plus Uf. We 
have one half the sum of the masses of the bullet and block uh, times v squared. That kinetic energy must be equal to the final potential energy, 0 0.00. Okay, sum of the masses times 9.8 times the, the height, it, it goes up to 0 0.00563 meters. It's 0.563 centimeters. And so we solve for v, we get v is 0.332 meters per second. Now that we know that v, the velocity of the bulletin block right after the collision is 0.33 meters per second, we can use conservation energy to find the velocity of the bullet uh, before the collision. So we have the momentum of the bullet, which is 0 0.00317, the mass of the bullet times vi, which we're trying to solve for, is equal to the sum of the masses of the bullet and the block times the speed of the, of the bullet and block, which we solve for, 0 0.332. And then we get that the initial for the bullet speed is 257 meters per second. Okay, the next one's a difficult problem. Um, we have this disc. It's 335.3 kilograms. The radius is 35.7 centimeters. And we have that the, uh, um, this, and then we have another mass that's 30.2 uh, kilograms that's attached by a string. And you want to know the acceleration of a block. So the way I like to teach how to solve this problem, first you convert, as far as I know, this is the fastest way to do this really difficult problem. First you convert the spinning disk into something that looks like a mass on a frictionless table. We're trying to make it turn it into this Atwood problem where we have one of the masses on a frictionless table horizontally. Okay. So in order to do that, we pull on the end of this pulley with a force F and figure out what the acceleration is of a point on, this, on the rim and that will tell us how much the mass would be of sort of the effective mass of this pulley, of this rotating pulley. Okay, so we have the torque is equal to R times F, but the torque is also equal to the moment of inertia I times alpha, where alpha is the end of acceleration. So Li for this, this, this uniform disk is one half m r squared. The um, angular acceleration is acceleration on the rim divided by the radius r. So simplifying gives us one half m r a. So r f the net will give the net torque, but that's also equal to one half m r a. So now we can write down dividing by r that f is equal to m over two times a. So reading this off, we see that the, it behaves like a mass of m over two. That's what's multiplying a. F net is equal to m m over two times a. So you know, a mass of m over two on a horizontal frictionless table. So now we put this m over 2, so that's 17.65 kilograms here. And then we, we draw this equivalent Atwood problem with this mass being horizontal on frictionless table. So now what we do is we consider both masses together, take this as the, upper, uh, the, up, the, the, the positive snake-like direction. So then the net force that we have on the system is just coming from the weight of this mass, which is small mg negative s direction, so f net s is equal to negative mg, which is negative, the mass 30.2 times 9.8, and so we get negative uh, 295.96, and now we know that f net s is equal to the sum of the masses, that's the total system, is with both masses, and capital M over 2 plus the small m, times the acceleration in the s direction, the sum of the masses is 17.65 plus 30.2, so we get AS is equal to negative 6.19 meters per second squared. Okay, we have next a uniform solid sphere of mass M and radius R rolling without slipping along a level plane with the speed V is equal to 3.95 meters per second when it encounters a plane that is at an angle of 23.9 above the horizontal. Find the maximum distance that the sphere travels up the plane in each case. Okay, so in both cases we need the distance it goes up. So if it goes up a distance y, this angle is 23.9, so d sine of 23.9 is equal to y. So the distance d will be y over 20, sine of 23.9, but that's equal to 2.468 times y. First case, the, the ramp is frictionless, so the, the, the sphere continues to spin, continues to rotate 
with its initial angular speed until it reaches the maximum height. Okay, so you want to know how high, how far it goes. In this case, we have conservation of energy, but the rotational kinetic energy will, won't be will, will remain the same for the initial and, and the final. So we'll have one f m b squared plus one f i omega squared for the initial energy. So there's only kinetic energy in the beginning. In the final case, we only have this rotational kinetic energy. This this motion of translation is not there anymore, but we have the potential energy m t y. So we can cross out these one half i omega squares from, from both sides, and we have one half m 3.95 squared, or 3.95 is the speed, initial speed, is equal to m times 9.80 times y. We can solve for y is 0.796. So d is equal to 2.468 times 0.796, so that's 1.96 meters. Now in the second case, what we have is rolling without slipping. So we need to have uh, the the total kinetic energy is one half m b squared plus one half i omega squared, but with rolling without slipping. The omega is linked to the velocity of the center mass. Omega is v over r, so we have v over r quantity squared. And the moment inertia is for solid spheres, two fifths m r squared, so we have one half two fifths m r squared, v over r quantity squared, and that comes out to one fifth m b squared. Now then the total, uh, sorry, it, and, okay, so. That's for, for the uh, one half i omega squared, but then we need to add one half m b squared. So we do one half plus one fifth gives you seven tenths, and so we have seven tenths m b squared. So now the conservation of energy, we have the total kinetic energy seven tenths m uh, b squared, so three point nine five squared, um, and that's equal to m g y. Okay, so we can solve for y. Y is equal to one point one one four. And then d is equal to 2.46 times that, which is 2.75 meters. Going on, we have a uniform uh, 28 kil kil uh, kilogram uniform beam is attached to a wall with a hinge, while its far end is supported by a cable such that the beam is horizontal. So they want to know what is the tension of the cable. So we have this is the rotation axis. We have this force uh, force of the beam acting from its center of mass right smack in the middle. Okay, this would be L over 2. We don't know L, but it won't matter. So the torque due to this force mg, the weight of the beam, will be um, the, the mass times the g, so n times g is 28 times 9.8, which is 274.4. And then we multiply by the lever arm L over 2. And it's going in this direction. It's clockwise. Now the tension uh, is going it's making counterclockwise torque, so we have this T here, and the, the the lever on vector is this guy here, and I extend it a bit, and then the angle between these two vectors is 116 degrees. You may be confused why I'm using 116 rather than 64, because it's the, the angle between the R vector and the F vector, so I need to extend the R vector, and then I get 116. But since I'm going to use the sine of 116, it won't actually matter whether I use 116 or 84, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's kind of an, uh, it's a foolproof uh, calculation. You won't make a mistake after you take the sign of, of the angle. Okay, so the torque due to take T will be LT, L is the lever on distance, times T times the sine of 116, that comes up to 0 0.899, uh, 8988L times T, kind of clockwise. So you setting the net torque equal to zero, we have 0.8988 LT is equal to the clockwise torque, which is 274.4. We solve for T and get 153 newtons. Okay, we have a spy satellite launched into Earth's orbit with a weight with a height 509 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. The radius of Earth is 6,370 kilometers, mass is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilometers. So first we want to know the distance from the center of the Earth to the point where the satellite is. So we add the 509 kilometers, we multiply the 10 to the third, convert to meters, times the radius of the Earth, 6,370 times 10 to the third, convert to meters, add them together, you get 6.879 times 10 to the sixth meters. Now the velocity of the orbit, the speed of the orbit is square root of gm over r, 
g is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And this is 5.97 times 10 to the 24, divided by the radius, 6.879 times 10 to the 6. Taking the square root of this ratio, we get 7,610 meters per second. To get the period, we take the circumference, the distance around one circle, which is 2 pi r, divided by the speed. And so plugging in r is 6.879 times 10 to the 6, divided by the speed, 7,610, we get 5,679 seconds. Okay, the next problem is about physical pendulum, pendula, and simple pendula. For a physical pendulum, the period is 2 pi over omega, where omega is the square root of mgr over i. So the formula is, by the way, let me just write this, square root of mgr over i. But we're going to uh, flip it over because it's 2 pi divided by omega, so we get the square root of i over mgr. Now for uh, A, this uh, solid uh, stick of uh, length L, mass M, we plug in the, from, from the end of the stick the moment of inertia is one third ml squared, okay? and the, um, the distance from the rotation point to the center mass here it will be halfway, so it'll be L over 2. That's what R stands for, since it's the center of mass from the rotation point. So we have mg L over 2. Simplifying gives us 2 pi over the square root, uh, 2 pi times the square root of 2L over 3G. Okay, now for the other pendulum, physical pendulum, the mass just doubles by a factor of 2. But you notice that um, the moment of inertia will double, and the mass will double, but this factor of 2 will just cancel out. So we end up getting 2 pi, the same answer, 2 squared root of 2L over 3G. Now for the simple pendulum, we just use the formula that it's 2 pi omega is square root of G over L. So omega is square root of G over L. And the period then will be 2 pi over omega. 2 pi squared to L over G. Now, if we change the length to 1 half L, this L becomes 1 half L, so we get square root of 2 L over 2 G. So now we can write down for pendulum 1, we, we found that it's equal to 1 C. Okay, for pendulum D, that's the short pendulum, simple pendulum case, we find it's uh, the answer is A, that's what we get here. Now, for pendulum D, it's the same as the other physical pendulum, There's, that depends on the mass, the overall mass. And so we get again uh, uh, a, 2 pi squared root of 2L over 3G. Now, uh, okay, so, so sorry, I, I'm, well, let me back up a second. I, I went slightly out of order. So, let me do it again. For pendulum A, uh, for pendulum A, uh, ah. okay. So, so for pendulum A, it's going to be this formula here: two pi square root of two L over three G, and then we go to pendulum D. Okay, so pendulum. And that will correspond with this one I did here, 2 pi squared root of L over 2G. And that gives A. Okay, sorry about the confusion. And then for pendulum B, that's the answer I've written here. And that will be square root of 2 L over 3G. That's the answer C here. And then for pendulum C, it's, that's a simple pendulum. And that gives you 2 pi squared root of L over G. And that gives the answer B. Okay, now we have this oscillation of the spring, mass 1.71 kilograms, uh, horizontal surface, and we have x is equal to 0.121 cosine of 2.23 times t. So this is just a cosine omega t. So we can read off a is 0.121, omega is 2.23 radius per second, but omega is the square root of k over m, so omega squared is k over m. 
can get k is equal to m omega squared, and that's 1.71 times 2.23 squared, which is 8.50 meters per meter. To get the total energy, that's 1 half kA squared, we figure out k is 8.50, a is 0.121, so we calculate that, that through, and we get 0 0.0622 joules. Okay, the next problem, we have a string, uh, wave, a wave on a string. We can read off all the pieces here. This is A, the amplitude. Okay, so that I want to know what the amplitude is, just read it off the first term here. That's 1.35 times 10 to the negative 2. They want to know the period, so look at this over here. This is 2 pi over t. So t is 2 pi over 2.21. That's 2.84 seconds. And then they want the wavelength to get the wavelength. This is just 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. So lambda is 2 pi over 6.31, that's 0.995 meters. And then the last one puts the speed of the wave, so that's lambda over t. We got that lambda is equal to 0.995, and t is equal to 2.84. You divide them, you get 0 0.350 meters per second. Okay. Next problem, we're dropping a tuning fork. You drop it from the, the Grand Canyon. You wait 5.8 seconds, and you hear a frequency of 1,451 hertz. You want to know what is the natural frequency of the tuning fork? We use the speed of sound 343 meters per second. First, we need to find out how fast the tuning fork is going down. So v y is equal to v zero y plus a x, which is sorry a a y, which is negative 9.8 times uh, delta t, which is 5.800. Um, so we get dy is negative 56.8 meters per second, so it's going down. Now we're going to use Doppler effect. So we have the observer that's stationary, we have the source that's moving, and it's moving away from the observer. So in this convention, ds is equal to negative 56.8. Okay? Because, because it's moving away. Not because of the, the sign convention here, but because it's moving away. Remember, that's the convention for the Doppler effect. So f prime is equal to f times speed of sound v plus v observer, which is 0, over v minus v s. So 343 is the speed of sound minus negative uh, 56.8. So that comes up to 0.8579 times f, the natural frequency. If we want to know the natural frequency, it's f prime divided by 0 0.8579. So we get 1,451. One divided with 0.8579, that comes out to 1,691. The last problem, uh, we are uh, looking at these circular wave fronts submitted by two wave sources. What is the phase difference between the waves at point R uh, expressed as a value between 0 and 2 pi? Okay, so point R, if I look at the waves from 1, they're in between these crests. For, for these crests, the phase is going to be 0. And for 2, we see, again, R is halfway in between the two crests. So in both cases, it's halfway in between the crests. So um, the phase difference in these, uh, for the, between the two waves, it will be zero. But because R is in between the crests for one and in between the crests for two.